Welcome to Secret Police. In this seventh episode of our Russia series, we are going to take a deep dive into the KGB itself. We'll examine its structure, leadership, and most of all, its spycraft, with particular interest in the KGB's ability to infiltrate governments across the globe. Which country's governments did the KGB infiltrate? How did one become a KGB agent? You are listening to the Secret Police Podcast. Do you have a problem with authority? Because I do. And I'm on a mission to help us build a healthy skepticism towards those in power. My name is Jack, and I spend hours researching and engaging with my morbid curiosity of dictatorships, and share with you the history and methods of the world's most brutal secret police forces. We look at how secret police enforce tyranny and strike fear in their people. Before we get started, a quick shout out to Agent J. Baumus. He's been a great supporter of this show, and you should follow him on Twitter at Baumus underscore J. That's at B-A-U-M, as in Mike, A-N, as in November, I-S, underscore letter J. Please remember to go over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give me some stars. Uh, that would be much appreciated. You can support the show at uh, patreon.com slash secretpolicepodcast. If you're uncomfortable giving monthly, I do take one-time donations via the PayPal link on secretpolicepodcast.com. Now, let's get into this show. Last episode, we learned how Nikita Khrushchev ultimately succeeded Stalin by building the correct power base in the Communist Party and removing rivals like Beria and Melenkov. Khrushchev embarked on wide reforms and repeals of Stalinist repression in a campaign of de-Stalinization. The secret police underwent reforms en route to becoming the KGB as well, before Khrushchev took power. So let's go back a ways and look at this progression. 1943, the infamous NKVD was split into two distinct organizations, the NKVD for internal affairs and the NKGB for state security. 1946, the term Ministry came back into fashion for naming government agencies rather than the more Soviet People's Commissariat. The NKVD and NKGB were reorganized into the Ministry of Internal Affairs, or the MVD, and the Ministry of State Security, the MGB. Still, the name changes mask the fact that these agencies are derivatives of the Cheka, and they performed many of the same duties as their predecessors. In 1953, Beria's death effectively subordinated the MVD to top party leadership, which was different from the NKVD, which was anchored to the party through Beria. So some responsibilities such as concentration camp operations typically performed by the secret police were routed to other ministries. So there was an effort to decentralize the MVD having inherited these administrative duties from the NKVD. Never again would a secret police chief in the Soviet Union be granted full membership in the Politburo, which had been renamed the Presidium in 1952. On March 13, 1954, the MVD was pulled apart and the MGB's responsibilities were transferred to the Committee for State Security or Komitet Gosudarst Vinoy Bezopasnosti, the KGB, the Cheka's final form. Despite the KGB's subordination to the Presidium, make no mistake that in practice the KGB was a super ministry of state security, according to historian Ronald Hingley. Let's take a closer look at the KGB's structure. And a big shout out here to the Cold War YouTube channel for this information. So the KGB was unique from other Soviet ministries in that the KGB had the authority to establish units or localized copies of itself inside existing structures of the entire Soviet Union, including the the satellite states. These smaller units could be set up anywhere, including the Red Army, transportation departments, and even internal affairs departments. It was a structure that allowed the KGB to be pervasive. 
The structure also allowed the passage of information from all facets of the Soviet Union to KGB officials ever watchful of potential threats from within and abroad. The KGB formed an intelligence-gathering entity and a state security entity, each tasked with different roles, though both bodies conducted their own intelligence gathering, counterintelligence of foreign nations, and monitoring uh, the Soviet people's loyalty to the state. The KGB was accountable exclusively to the Communist Party. The head of the KGB was allowed to be a member of the Central Committee, but they were not allowed membership in the Politburo, like I said earlier. This rule was a reform designed to limit the power of the KGB chief, so they would not amass as much power as Beria had in the past. This also had the added benefit of keeping the KGB's dirty little mitts off investigating senior uh, government leadership. As part of reforming the state security services, Khrushchev reduced the number of security agents employed and closed several hundred facilities across the USSR. In 1959, the KGB was made accountable to the Presidium of the Central Committee. The Communist Party was in charge of making personnel decisions. Leadership positions in the KGB would be filled by party members and not strictly members of the KGB itself. Already, this is quite different from the NKVD, in that there is more oversight by the party rather than having a super-secret police uh, cannibalize the whole country. The KGB could not legally hold as much power as the NKVD held, but they were still formidable and exerted their power abroad. Each department in the KGB was called a directorate. Some directorates of the KGB included external intelligence, internal intelligence and counterintelligence, ciphering, state border protection, protection of party leaders, protection of special objects, you know, like Yagoda's fine wines and dildos, and electric and radio surveillance. These are just a few. The KGB also had naval, air, and armored units within the regular armed forces and special forces called Spetsnaz. The KGB occasionally involved themselves with internal political matters, as we will see later in the next episode, but overall, this, the, um, the secret police were reformed to significantly reduce the risk of another Beria-like chief. <music> Moving on to the KGB's early leadership. The KGB's first chief, or chairman technically, was Ivan Serov. We met Ivan Serov briefly in part five when we talked about the Soviet annexation of eastern Poland in 1939. The annexed portion of Poland suffered an estimated 1.2 million civilians deported from their homes and an additional 250,000 Polish military personnel deported during hostilities with the Soviets. Deputy Commissar of the NKVD, Ivan Serov, or then Deputy Commissar, was the deportation master in Poland. Serov eliminated every perceived threat to the USSR. Bankers, business owners, hotel owners, restaurateurs, prison wardens, clergymen, members of non-communist political parties, and people who were expelled from the Communist Party. A lot of people from the Polish bourgeois class. So despite the KGB reforms, they still needed a joy of a human being to be its chief. Comes with the territory of secret policing. British news media dubbed him Ivan the Terrible, or the Butcher. Serov was also a subordinate of Khrushchev in their Ukraine days. Now, remember how Khrushchev and Melenkov persuaded Serov to betray Beria? The position of NKVD chief could have been, or rather was likely, a way for Khrushchev to, uh, to scratch Serov's back. Historian Ronald Hingley writes about a defecting KGB agent who claimed that, quote, Khrushchev could never have risen to supreme power had it not been for the KGB and Serov, end quote. This is a testament to the KGB's power despite the reforms. To some degree, they acted as power brokers. In 1958, Serov was transferred to head the Red Army's intelligence body, the GRU. In his place stepped in Alexander Shalepin, who was better suited to lead the KGB through this more liberal era in Soviet history, where some free expression was permitted. Shalepin had served in the Red Army during the final days of the Winter War in Finland, and helped organize a guerrilla partisan movement in Moscow as the Germans advanced on the Kremlin. 
Shilipin formally organized this partisan movement after the execution of Zoya Cosmo Demonskaya, an 18-year-old woman who set fires to multiple houses in a village used by German occupiers as a communications hub. When she was caught, she was stripped naked, beaten with 200 lashes, interrogated, and burned. She never gave up any information about her co-conspirators. She was brought to the center of the village with a board hung around her neck that read House Burner. In her final moments, she praised Stalin and the Soviet people's resistance and warned the Germans that they could not hang them all and that Stalin would come for them. The Germans hung Cosmo Demyanskaya and left her body swinging from the gallows for weeks. Other Germans and their uh, collaborators defiled and desecrated her body, and somebody cut off one of her breasts. Good God. Before the Red Army recaptured this village, the Germans quickly buried the body in an attempt to hide the evidence. The Soviets posthumously declared Cosmo Demyanskaya a hero of the Soviet Union. What does Shilipin have to do with her death? He personally appointed her to do arson on German-held villages. Her death, of course, caught Stalin's attention, and then Shilipin by association. Shilipin was appointed a senior official of Cosmo, the All-Union uh, Leninist Young Communist League, a youth organization of which Cosmo Demyanskaya had joined in 1938 as a high school student. Shilepin continued to have a successful career gaining promotions in important positions. Khrushchev appointed Shilepin for a number of reasons, but notably, Shilepin achieved higher education in history and literature. This, uh, this set Shilepin apart from his predecessors. He did not have a background in state security, and his intellectual, intellectual approach would hopefully improve the image of the KGB. In November 1961, Shilepin departed the KGB. He was succeeded by Ukrainian-born Vladimir Semichesny. He had a similar background to Shilepin, having been first secretary of the Komsomol Communist Youth League. Years before, in 1958, Semichesny delivered a speech to about 14,000 people following the Nobel Prize for Literature Award to Russian writer Boris Pasternak, where Semichesny compared the writer's domestic habits to those of supposedly cleaner pigs. As KGB chief, Semichesny kept close relations with both Khrushchev and Shalepin. At times, it seemed as if Semichesny was more of an agent of Shalepin, who by this time had moved on to duties with the Central Committee. It is also clear that both Semichesny and Shalepin became wary of Khrushchev over time, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Let's check in with Premier Khrushchev for a moment. On February 25th, 1956, Khrushchev shocked Soviet leadership with what's been called his secret speech to the 20th Party Congress. He attacked Stalin's godlike reputation and exposed the Man of Steel's many crimes against the Soviet people. Many of these crimes, as you know, were carried out by the NKVD under Yagoda, Yezhov, and Beria. Khrushchev shed light on the suspicious death of Sergei Kirov, the doctor's plot, and the widespread use of torture by the NKVD to extract confessions. Khrushchev basically took a huge dump on Stalin and conveniently left himself out of any wrongdoing must have felt great to reveal Stalin's crimes without consequences. All of those drunken benders and lap dances at Stalin's dacha had paid off. To be clear, Khrushchev didn't give uh, people lap dances. I, I just think that's funny to me. I don't think Khrushchev exposed the horrors of, say, uh, Cannibal Island. He may not have known about that. Uh, but he did reform the concentration camp system. According to Ronald Hingley, the prison population was significantly reduced between 1953 and 1956, but the data that does exist is likely unreliable, and the gulag system was never fully abolished. Prisoner strikes and demonstrations uh, encouraged further camp relaxation. However, some demonstrations were violently squashed, such as when in 1954, in Kinjir, Kazakhstan, soldiers broke into the women's barracks and bayoneted them to death. Overall, the Soviet government made an effort to significantly reduce the portion of political prisoners. According to information gathered by Ronald Hingley, there were 3 million prisoners in the USSR at the time of Stalin's death. 
and about half were political prisoners. Officials may have reduced the portion of political prisoners to 1 or 2 percent of the eight or 900,000 total prisoners remaining in 1957. Take this with a grain of Soviet salt because it's tough to suss out accurate information from so long ago. Like I said, these figures are likely unreliable. In December 1958, the penal code was liberalized to not give the political police the ability to paint political dissidents with such a broad brush as in times past, so the KGB could not operate with such loose bounds. The KGB relinquished control of the gulags on paper, but they maintained supervision through those localized networks of officers and sometimes secret informants. Speaking of KGB informants, what exactly did it take to become a KGB agent and how were they recruited? The KGB recruited agents in numerous ways. Ex-KGB agent Jack Barsky detailed how he was recruited by the KGB. You can find numerous interviews with Jack, by the way. He seems like an interesting guy and you should look him up on YouTube. Jack notes a simple distinction between the KGB and the CIA, for example. So the CIA is an institution that you can apply for like any other job. But the KGB never did that. In Soviet Russia, KGB chooses you. And I'm not even joking about that. Jack Barsky's recruitment followed these methods. Jack was a student at University of Vienna in the state of Thuringia, part of East Germany at the time. Jack's goal was to become a tenured professor, and to him, spying was the stuff of fiction. One weekend, though, Jack was visited, unbeknownst to him, by a KGB agent in, at his dorm room. He figured in later years the KGB uh, obtained his records from the Stasi, the East German secret police, who kept meticulous records on everybody in East Germany. And Jack had a neighbor who was an exchange student from the Soviet Union, who likely tipped off the KGB that Jack would be alone on a weekend night. The agent interviewed Jack a bit before revealing himself to work for the government, and Jack was interested. He built relationships with some of these guys for over a year before the KGB formally invited him in. Uh, this particular recruitment story, um, I don't do it justice, so I encourage you to watch the his interviews about this. But the takeaway here is that the KGB sought you out, like I said, and they sought the best of the best individuals for specific missions or roles that they had in mind. We saw a similar tactic with Richard Sorge from, from part four, or uh, yeah, part, part five, excuse me, part five. Of course, he was recruited by the NKVD, but he didn't seek them out. They approached Sorge at Comintern. Now, the KGB had other, more insidious ways of recruiting Westerners as spies, including using blackmail to compromise individuals or offering huge sums of money. But the most effective method was the slow approach in building a relationship with somebody and finding common ideological ground. Here's retired KGB officer Mikhail Lubimov, featured in a Cold War documentary to explain. If the KGB gets some material, compromising material on a person, mainly it, connected, it is connected either with sexual or with homosexual affairs or something, they usually show the material. If a person rejects the offer, they send this material to his superiors or to the relatives. But the most popular approach when you recruit a person is gradual approach on an ideological basis, you see, common ideology, or you're a left-wing guy, I'm a left-wing guy. Once somebody accepted an offer to join the KGB, or was forced to, training began. Jack notes that training was in-depth, but not exactly a structured program in all aspects. The type of training varied depending on the job they needed you for. But Jack was trained in Morse code, shortwave radio, and manual encryption and decryption algorithms. Jack was equipped with a notepad, the first uh, 10 pages of which were coated with a special chemical used for secret writing. He was trained in counter surveillance and learned how to essentially use a uh, microscope in reverse to make photographs and other images or text tiny, like the tip of a pen tiny. These small images could be hidden on stamps or coins. 
Jack was required to learn at least one additional language and immerse himself in Western culture. He talks about doing a lot of reading of Western literature and watching West German TV. It helped him pick up on those little cultural nuances that we don't even think about when interacting with other people. The KGB never assigned him reading or other tasks. All the KGB asked for were monthly reports on his activities. Why? Part of the evaluation is measuring somebody's initiative. Will this potential agent do work when given little direction or supervision? Again, I speculate that training was different based on the specific job, especially considering the different directorates within the KGB. Nonetheless, Jack's particular experience is incredibly valuable information. He was one agent in a vast international network. So let's now move on to some of those other Soviet agents that operated during the Cold War. Let's start with Colonel Rudolf Abel. If you've seen Bridge of Spies, Abel was portrayed by British actor Mark Rylance. The real Rudolf Abel was born William August Fisher in July 1903 in Newcastle-upon-Tyne in northern England, a village closer to Edinburgh than London. His parents were Russian immigrants, but he moved to Russia to serve with the Red Army Radio Battalion in 1925. He was fluent in English, German, Russian, Polish, and Yiddish. <laughs> Whatever. Freaking talented multilingual people. As somebody who's as good with words as rope is for a pool stick, I'm jealous. Abel was recruited by the OGPU secret police in May 1927 and traveled abroad outside the Soviet Union as a radio operator. He returned to the USSR in 1936 to head the school training other radio operators who would later reside inside another country illegally to spy. He was damn near caught up in the Great Purge because his brother-in-law was accused of being a Trotskyist and because Abel was born in the UK. But Abel was instead merely dismissed from the NKBD. In my personal opinion, I'm kind of baffled that he continued to be loyal to the state after that kind of brush with death, and considering maybe he knew how prisoners were treated in gulags. Oh, okay, my government will literally dispose of me when it sees fit, so I'm going to fight for this system. You can't see me, but I'm hardcore eye-rolling right now. During World War II, Abel was recalled to train radio operators who would perform clandestine operations behind German lines. In 1946, Abel rejoined the would-be KGB and trained to spy within the United States. Through a complex web of stolen passports and birth certificates, he gained access to the U.S. using a dead guy's documents and that person's name. Of course, back in the day when something like that would actually work. A little bit more about these stolen documents because I actually found this to be quite interesting. So Abel used a U.S. passport that was retained by a U.S. citizen who had applied for a visa to the Soviet Union to visit family in Lithuania. The source says that this person got sick while traveling, and I speculate that he or she, I guess, must have, or he, because how could Abel use a female's passport? Um, so this person traveling in Lithuania must have died due to this unspecified illness. Then officials went through his stuff and kept the passport for future espionage or forgery purposes. Now, it's kind of the same thing with the U.S. birth certificate. The NKVD obtained U.S. birth certificates from foreign combatants in the Spanish Civil War, and why they were traveling with their birth certificates, I have no idea. I'm thinking that they picked documents off of dead or captured foreign fighters, again, for the purpose of future espionage, forgery, or both. So in 1953, Abel moved to a studio apartment in Brooklyn, New York, posing as a painter and photographer. So nobody questioned his irregular hours or his long stints away from home. He also mingled and befriended people in the New York art scene. Now, what was Abel actually doing in the U.S.? He was a handler of other Soviet spies who gathered information regarding the U.S. nuclear program and other sensitive information. He got caught and arrested by the FBI early on the morning of June 21st, 1957. A captured KGB agent uh, gave up Abel's code name, Mark during interrogations with the FBI and verified Abel's identity. So this captured KGB agent gave up the name Rudolf Ivanovich Abel. Now remember, the real Rudolf Ivanovich Abel is a dead man, and that William Fisher Abel is masquerading as Rudolf Abel. I know this is super confusing. Maybe maybe it's not. I'm, <laughs> I think I'm just confusing myself. Uh, so the captured, uh, the captured KGB agent 
knew that um, knew that this was fishy because he personally knew the real Rudolf Abel. When the FBI raided his apartment, they found evidence of espionage and a ton of cash. The FBI found $4,000 in cash and a key for a safe deposit box containing an additional $15,000 in cash. Now, $19,000 total in 1957, uh, by the way, is slightly over 200 grand in 2023 dollars. They also found a shortwave radio, cipher pads, code books, encrypted messages on microfilm, photo equipment for producing micro dots, which Jack, Bar uh, Jack Barsky talked about. That's the technique of taking images and shrinking them. What could have looked like dots of ink on a piece of paper were actually paragraphs of text. Abel also had uh, trick containers like hollowed out screws. Imagine this for a moment. You're turning over an entire apartment looking for a tiny message or evidence of espionage and you cannot find it because it's in a hollowed out screw that fastens, say, an oven handle or secures a knob on a dresser. That would be maddening. In 1962, Abel was exchanged for Francis Gary Powers, a U-2 spy plane pilot who was shot down over the Soviet Union two years prior. Okay, moving on to another spy group, um, we'll talk about the Cambridge Five. And um, for those of you who are familiar, I realize that some of these people and groups did not serve strictly with the KGB, but rather its predecessor agencies before service with the KGB. And so what I'm saying is they started their careers in a different secret police organization, and then that, uh, that role transferred over to a role in the KGB. So the Cambridge Five were a group of five British men who were recruited by Soviet intelligence while they were students at Cambridge University in the 1930s. The group uh, members included Kim uh, Philby, Guy Burgess, Donald McLean, Anthony Blunt, and John Cairncross. Kim Philby was recruited by Soviet intelligence in 1934 and worked as a journalist before jo uh, joining MI6, where he was able to provide Soviet the Soviet Union with information about British intelligence operations. Guy Burgess worked in the Foreign Office and was responsible for leaking a large amount of sensitive information to the Soviet Union. Donald McLean, who we will call Mr. Clean, worked for the British Foreign Office and was responsible for passing on information about British foreign policy to the Soviet Union. Anthony Smokablund, who worked at the, uh, uh, how do you say this? Um, Courtauld Institute of Art was responsible for passing uh, all the nude paintings and sculptures from the Art Institute to the Soviet Union for uh, Stalin's personal, um, uh, you know, Stalin's uh, enjoyment. The, the Kremlin would send a very simple go code to Mr. Blunt that simply said, send nudes. No, oh, whoops. Okay, I got my, I think I got my notes mixed up here. Uh, actually, Anthony Blunt passed information about MI5 to the Soviet Union. John Cairncross worked in the British government's uh, intelligence department and provided the Soviet Union with information about U.S. intelligence activities. It was really a, a league of extraordinary traitors who held important positions in the British government and intelligence. The Cambridge Five communicated via codes, signals, and secret meetings. They were careful to avoid detection by their British colleagues and maintained their cover for years. One of their methods was to pass information to a middleman. Using a middleman ensured that the group members were not uh, in direct contact with Soviet intelligence officers and reduced the risk of being caught. They also used dead letter drops, which involved leaving messages or documents at predetermined locations for others to pick up without direct contact. These drops were often used to send and receive messages to and from Soviet intelligence officers in other countries. The Cambridge Five were eventually caught and exposed by a combination of factors, including intelligence work by the British government and uh, defections by Soviet agents. In 1951, Burgess and uh, McLean defected to the Soviet Union. That raised suspicion about other Soviet spies in the British government. This combined with intelligence gathering from Soviet defector Igor Gaushenko led to a full-scale investigation into Soviet espionage in, espionage in the British government. The investigation, led by MI5 officer Peter Wright, focused on the work of the Cambridge Five, and in 1956, it was discovered that Blunt had been a Soviet agent since the 30s. 
Blunt was subsequently granted immunity from prosecution in exchange for his cooperation in the investigation. Philby was tipped off about the investigation and then fled to the Soviet Union, where he lived until he, um, uh, how you say, uh, he decided to live under the ground permanently in 1988. Burgess and Cairn Cross had also fled to the Soviet Union by this time. Only McLean had been living in Moscow since 1951, and he later, uh, or excuse me, he was later arrested by Soviet authorities. The exposure of the Cambridge Five was a significant blow to British intelligence, and it led to increased efforts to root out Soviet spies in the British government and intelligence services. The exposure of this spy ring led to a major overhaul of British intelligence services, as well as a deeper understanding of the depth and reach of Soviet espionage during the Cold War. Okay, one more notable spy here. Um, Robert Lee Johnson was a U.S. Army sergeant who spied for the KGB from 1953 to 1964. He provided the Soviets with a variety of sensitive U.S. military secrets, including information about U.S. troop deployments in Europe, the position and quantity of nuclear missiles in Europe, and NATO code-breaking capabilities. Clearly, Johnson was a particularly valuable asset to the KGB due to his access to this breadth and depth of information. NATO, by the way, stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and we will explore NATO more in subsequent episodes. One of the ways that Johnson performed espionage for the KGB was by meeting with his handlers at various locations, including uh, the Orly Airport in Paris, which was Paris's main airport until the opening of Charles de Gaulle in 1974. But why this airport? It was the location of a U.S. Armed Forces Courier Center and key transportation hub for code systems and materials shipped from the U.S. en route to NATO headquarters. At Orly, Johnson would meet with KGB agents and exchange information, often using techniques like dead drops to avoid detection. He also spied for the KGB during his stationing at missile bases in California, going as far as to provide the KGB with a sample of missile fuel. Johnson's espionage activities were eventually stopped by a tip from a defecting Soviet agent to the West. Johnson was arrested, tried, and sentenced to 25 years in prison, which, in my personal opinion, not being an attorney, uh, 25 years seems light for what he did. Betrayed his country and the U.S. Army. To me, one of the scariest and most fascinating aspects about the KGB was that they internationalized Soviet secret policing. A KGB agent didn't need to be a white guy with a Russian accent. He could look like you or me, they could be a woman, they could be your friend, family member, neighbor, or colleague. They could be American, they could be African, Asian, Latin. And I think that's what made the KGB both terrifying and tricky to route out from institutions. Despite the KGB's adherence to structure, they truly had an amorphous set of agents ready to defend the principles of communism. I would like to address why uh, some Westerners may betray their own nations and work for an institution like the KGB. And to answer this, we can turn to some common external factors for why somebody might betray their country. Those factors are money, ideology, compromise, and ego. The MICE acronym. Somebody who loves money, has a lot of debt, maybe a gambling addiction, or just has to keep a certain lifestyle who is also well-placed inside a government agency or defense contractor could be turned into a KGB asset for a big payoff. Now, somebody else who finds communism or Marxism to be the true path to utopia or feels that capitalism is exploitive of people or the environment could be turned into a spy for the KGB on an ideological basis. This was the most effective method. Compromise. We heard an example of compromise from ex-KGB agent Mikhail Lubomov. Suppose we have a fictitious employee, we'll call him Ted, who works in Lockheed Martin's R&D department in the 1950s. Ted is married with two kids in the quintessential nuclear family. But the KGB has an eye on Ted, and they discover that Ted has a male lover. KGB agents snap extremely private photos of Ted and his partner. But maybe the partner is also a KGB agent. Whatever the case, an agent approaches Ted one day and says, you will provide us with blueprints and performance data of your new jet engines. Ted tells the agent to kick rocks, you commie bastard. But then the agent shows Ted the photos, says he has copies, and threatens to send them to his wife. 
and his boss. Ted is compromised. And to avoid losing his family, job, and suffer the stigmatism of being outed as gay in the 50s, Ted becomes a KGB spy. Ego. Somebody who just feels that they need to have all the attention and recognition for their accomplishments, and doesn't get enough of that. So they feel resentment towards their employer. Maybe this type of person likes the power of having the secret that they're a double agent. Ted got that big promotion instead of me, so now it's time for revenge. This type of person can be turned into a KGB spy to stroke their own self-esteem. These are just external factors, or examples of external factors. Clinical psychologist and Israeli Mossad associate Ilan Diamant notes that a well-adjusted and mature personality is less likely to break in the face of the above factors. Now that we've looked at these recruitment methods, let's explore some of the other tools in the KGB's Bolshevik toolbox. Assassinations, infiltration, and interrogations. Let's start with the juicy stuff, assassinations, also known as wet work. The KGB carried out multiple assassinations in the 1950s via multiple different methods, but man, did the KGB love them some poison? For example, in 1954, Georgi Okolovich narrowly dodged an assassination attempt uh, and only escaped thanks to a tip. The assassin was to perform the murder with a gun disguised, disguised as a leather a cigarette case. The gun had three different rounds, one lead bullet, one bullet containing cyanide, and a steel bullet, which honestly seems kind of elaborate to me, but whatever floats your assassin boat, I guess. Uh, moving on to a different case, um, Lev Rebet was a figure in the Ukrainian government and editor of an anti-communist uh, newspaper. In 1957, Rebet was attacked by an assassin in a Munich office building. The assassin shot Rebet with a spray gun filled with cyanide. In 1959, Ukrainian resistance leader Stepan Bandera was also killed in Munich by a KGB agent with a cyanide gun. Some of you might be thinking about the guy who was poisoned with a with a rice and delivered via a subtle poke with an umbrella, but that didn't happen until 1978, so we're going to leave that for a different time. Poison seems to have been the favorite method by the KGB. Cyanide, ricin, and later more complex chemical agents like tetrachlorodibenzodioxin or just dioxin uh, were used to ship their enemies to the almighty of your choice. Strangulation and drowning were other methods used to dispatch individual threats of, uh, to the Soviet Union. The KGB was also on the short list of shadowy suspects in the Kennedy assassination. Now let's take it a notch down from assassinations and talk about interrogations. Enemies of the state would first be arrested and then incarcerated by the KGB. The interrogators would first document a plan for the interrogation. So they would uh, write down things like how they were going to approach the interrogation based on the prisoner's attributes like social status or cooperation. They documented what information would be extracted and the crimes committed and charged. Then these plans would be submitted for review by a supervisor for comment and critique. Interrogations were almost always done at night, perhaps a tradition carried over from the Cheka. Prisoners would be woken up almost immediately after they fell asleep, and this would happen repeatedly to add to their physical and psychological discomfort. With little to no rest, prisoners would be forced to stand for 18 to 24 hour periods or placed in stress positions for long periods of time. Some interrogators played good cop, bad cop, where one KGB officer played nice and garnered the prisoner's trust while the other KGB agent was openly hostile, including using a person's first name if the prisoner was a person of high social standing as a way to show no regard for their status. Other forms of psychological torture were practiced at places like the infamous KGB corner house in Riga, Latvia. Now called the Museum of the Occupation of Latvia 1940-1991, to Corner House was a KGB prison where inmates were tortured and murdered. Cells designed for four inmates were crammed with 40-plus inmates. Sound familiar? The Cheka liked to stuff their prison cells, too. Peepholes fixed into the thick concrete walls gave the guards an uninhibited view of the beds, and if an inmate fell asleep, 
the guard knew to wake them up immediately. For prisoners the KGB really wanted to break, they were crammed in a less than one by one meter concrete cell with only the space to sit. No windows, no toilet. A prisoner would have to endure this for up to three full days. There was no point in shimmering up into the space above since the ceilings of these solitary cells were sealed shut to trap a person in this upright tomb. To top this off, the guards made sure to produce repetitive sounds day and night. Prisoners were only allowed 10 minutes outside in a small courtyard enclosed by a steel cage and wire. Outdoor time was not for exercise, but rather to let prisoners hear the sounds of Riga, a whisper from the outside world, and the freedom they lacked. The prison was also fitted with an execution chamber with a slanted floor, which allowed blood to flow down for easier cleanup for the next one-way ride to the afterlife. Now let's move on to infiltration, arguably the KGB's speciality. What do we mean when we talk about infiltration? Well, according to Marion Webster, infiltration is the process of passing agents or troops into enemy-held positions surreptitiously with hostile intent or takeover. The hostility may not be obvious at first. The goal may be to fill an institution with agents before an attack, like positioning your chess pieces before you strike. Infiltration can be human or electronic, such as hacking a computer system and installing malware to track activity or uploading a virus at a later date. We've seen infiltration play out many times in this series. The Okrana infiltrated informal labor groups with fake organizations. The NKVD infiltrated both German and Japanese high command via Ricard Sorge. Soviet spies also penetrated parts of the Manhattan Project to steal information for the construction of early nuclear weapons. If there was an Olympic gold medal for infiltration, it would go to the KGB. KGB infiltration operations occurred on a global scale. Let's turn our attention to Asia and KGB activities in Japan. So how this worked is, according to the KGB's structure, a total of 10 departments representing different geographic regions fell under the administration of the first chief directorate in the 1950s. The seventh department managed KGB activities in Japan, India, Indonesia, and other Asian nations. Hirohida Ishida, codenamed Hoover, was one of several KGB agents operating in Japan. Ishida served as chief cabinet secretary under two different prime ministers from 1956 to 1957 and was appointed for five terms as minister of labor for four prime ministers. In 1960, he published an article predicting that by 1970 that Japan's Socialist Party would take power because of what he saw as inaction on increasing urbanization and educational needs and the shrinking agricultural sector. This paper sparked the ruling Liberal Democratic Party to make changes. Ishida also chaired the Japan-USSR Friendship Parliamentarians Union during trips to Moscow in the 1970s. Ishida was outed as a KGB spy by defecting KGB major Stanislav Levchenko, who had connections to other Japanese KGB agents as well. The KGB also penetrated India's government. In fact, Christopher Andrew, professor of modern and contemporary history at Cambridge University, argues that India was the test case for Russia's battle for influence of nations not aligned with itself or the United States. The KGB took what it learned about infiltrating developing nations and applied those lessons in Africa and Latin America. In the 1960s, the KGB increased their efforts in India successfully infiltrating Indian news media and planting more than 5,000 articles in the press. Obviously, India never subscribed to communism to the extent of China, but India relied on support from the Soviet Union and maintains a relationship with Russia to this day. North Korea maintained relations with the Soviet Union and the KGB in exchanges that seemed to have favored North Korea. The nation relied heavily on support from the Soviets when Korea split. Archives published by the Wilson Center describe that the North Korean Ministry of State Security fixated on obtaining the latest technologies and training from the KGB. The KGB agreed to train 
North Korean agents in criminalistics, radio, and operational technology, radio technology, and wiretapping at the KGB's own training facilities. This I found most interesting, though. North Korea maintained labor camps for harvesting lumber in parts of Siberia, and I'm 95% confident North Korea still operates lumber yards inside Russia. Seriously, the chair you're sitting on right now could have wood harvested by prison laborers. The KGB helped maintain security at these facilities and would hunt down any escapees from the lumber yards and return them to North Korea. And the KGB did the same thing to citizens trying to escape North Korea itself. Now let's hop over to Africa. In general, the KGB offered support to the underground liberation movements attempting to expunge their colonial overlords. To be fair, the US did the same thing with the CIA. See, to the US and the Soviets, where there is political change, there is a potential power vacuum. And where there is a power vacuum, there is an opportunity to gain a regional ally in exchange for aid. The KGB was instrumental in helping young and newly independent African nations develop their security services. Information was exchanged between these young nations and Moscow. Agents from nations such as Angola were trained by the KGB, and Russia donated operational hardware. Soviet military advisors were sent to Angola to train their army. Across the Atlantic, Latin America had a similar experience with the KGB as Africa. Now, like many African nations, Latin America experienced subjugation by powers like Spain, France, and Portugal. In the 1950s and 60s, the United States greatly exerted its influence on the continent, much to the chagrin of many Latin nations. However, the USSR was more than happy to assist left-wing movements and curtail America's influence. Khrushchev's policy towards Latin America was to aggressively expand Soviet influence since developing nations, or the Third World in Cold War terms, was seen as key to the ultimate victory of socialism. Now, there was not a point where a Latin American country was seen as an enemy by the, Uni by the Soviets, according to a lecture by Nikolai Leonov on Soviet intelligence in Latin America during the Cold War. This apparently was true even during Augusto Pinochet's rule in Chile. Instead, the Soviets took every opportunity to weaken American influence on the continent. The KGB could more easily establish contact with Americans in South America, collect information, and exchange money. The Soviets had access to American businessmen, politicians, journalists, Americans of various walks of life useful for Soviet espionage. The KGB also supported socialist movements and parties within Latin American countries. Perhaps the most obvious example of this support took place in Cuba. But unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it here for this week. And we'll visit Cuba and delve into a more controversial aspect of the KGB spying in America. Thank you for listening to this episode of Secret Police, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you wish to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash secretpolicepodcast, or for one-time donations, secretpolicepodcast.com, and scroll to the very bottom of the page to a PayPal link. If nothing else, please hurdle some stars my way on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can follow me on Twitter at hush underscore popo or Instagram at secretpolicepodcast. Agents dismissed.